focus on you for the next half an hour or so. Father, we, we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Guys, thanks so much. Meredith came up to me this morning. She said, I can't say I have no voice. I think she did very good. And, and Emily had to pick up her lead. Emily, excellent job. Thank you so much for doing that.
the gospel seems like gospel seems like a churchy word. It seems like a religious term. What is this gospel? How does gospel relate to Easter? Maybe you're here this morning, you've heard the Easter story year after year after year, time after time after time, and you've heard a lot of messages about the gospel, you're thinking, oh no, not another message about the gospel. If you grew up in church, you could be very familiar with the Easter story and with the gospel, but I warn you this morning, as I have to warn myself, be careful. Don't allow these stories to become familiar. Because what becomes familiar becomes ordinary to us. I've heard this all before. I don't really need to hear it again. We, maybe some of us are zoned out already. But what becomes familiar becomes ordinary. What becomes ordinary loses its power in our lives. It's just another thing. It's kind of like the sun coming up this morning, another beautiful sunrise. It loses its impact. Sometimes we take the gospel for granted. Sometimes we take the story behind Easter Sunday, we take it for granted. Sometimes we, we even take the gospel, we take some truths out of the Bible, and we use them as part of our plan instead of using the gospel as our plan. It's not part of our plan. It is our plan. God's plan for us. When you're familiar with something, you, you, you allow it to just fly right over you. And this morning I'm, I'm praying against that for all of us. I pray that all of you, young believer, believer who have been believing for a long time, older believer, I pray that we allow ourselves to be wrecked by Easter, be wrecked by the gospel. So I ask us all this morning, listen closely. Maybe for the first time. Maybe again. Listen closely. Fresh ears. Open heart. Pay extra attention this morning to this message. I hope that you came here expecting to hear from God. I hope that you came here to praise Him and worship Him and thank Him, yeah. But I hope you're here because you want to hear from God. I pray that you listen to what He has to say for you because, to you because it matters. Life is short. Eternity is not. Allow the gospel to impact your life. If you've been here for any length of time, you know I usually end every, every message with a question. I'm not at the end yet, but I'm going to ask you a question at this point in time. If you're here right now and you're a believer, you're here right now and you're a believer, was there ever a point in your life where you were more impacted by the gospel than you are right now. Think back over your life. Has there ever been a point in your life where you were more passionate about Jesus than you are right now? Maybe when you first accepted Jesus. Maybe you're at a church camp. Maybe you're at a Kingdom Bound Festival. Maybe you're at some kind of a women's retreat or a men's retreat or some church service. And you came to the Lord and you're so on fire and you chased hard after him for a while. Was there ever a point in your time where you were more fervent in prayer, more desires of prayer, more, you just wanted to know it more. Have you ever been at more, have you ever been more on fire for the Lord than you are right now? If you just said, yeah, honestly, there was a time. In fact, I feel like God is distant from me right now. In fact, I feel like my life is just so busy right now at this point in my life. I got a lot going on in my life. I'll get back to it, though. But right now, I just don't feel like he's first in my life. Honestly, I don't. Then you need the gospel. And maybe you said, no. Maybe you said, no, nah, man, I am chasing hard after Jesus. You know, it's taken a while, but he moved from like 19th on my priority list up to 12th, up to 10th. He's up to like third. I'm chasing hard after him right now. You need the gospel. If you said yes or no, you need the gospel. Why? Because the gospel will center you each and every day. And the gospel will give you fuel to keep you going. It'll fire you up. It'll encourage you. It'll empower you. It will make you bold. Maybe you're here and you don't really know what the gospel is all about. I 
you slide on it without the, you know, let it get the service over and let it forgotten about it. Maybe you're here and you don't really know what this gospel is all about. What is the gospel? Here it is, this churchy word. This is where I zone out because I don't really understand. It's kind of like calculus to me. If I don't really understand calculus, I don't like it. I don't get it. I don't understand it. I don't want to be around it. That's how gospel, that's how churchy words are to us sometimes. Maybe you don't really understand the gospel. Maybe you have some kind of an idea, but you're not 100% sure what the gospel is. Maybe you're here this morning, and honestly, you have doubts about all of this. I'm only here because I got a drug here. I have doubts about church. Maybe you're thinking I got doubts about God. I got doubts about this gospel that you speak of. You need the gospel. We all need the gospel. This morning, we're going to take a look at the gospel. We're going to take a look at what Jesus has done for you on Easter. We're going to look at what is available to you today. So no matter where you are on your journey, we all need the gospel. Every one of us needs it. We need God to help us hear the gospel so that we fully understand it, so that we can grasp it, so we can allow it to wreck us. We need to humble ourselves, be open to it. Because if we allow God to work in us this morning, then we can walk out of here differently than how we walked in. I believe that. Let's pray. As we enter into prayer, just ask that God speaks to you this morning. He knows your doubts. He knows your fears. He knows your questions. He knows your struggles. He knows your obedience. Just ask him to speak to you this morning. Tell him that you will respond. Let's pray. Father, I need you this morning. Father, please allow the Holy Spirit to open our ears to the word you have for us. Open our eyes to the world that's around us that needs Jesus. Open our hearts to the truth that you want us to hear and live by. Father, please refresh us. Do not allow us to ever become familiar or comfortable with this Easter story or with the gospel. Father, I pray that your word will impact our souls and that we can walk out of here different than how we walked in. Father, please allow me to speak accurately and clearly the truth you've laid on my heart to share with this family this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So the gospel, what is the gospel? Well, a good place to start, I always say if you have a question, you go to the Bible, okay? Don't ever take anything that I say here for granted. Check it out if you want. Go and read about it. Sometimes we'll read one verse here. We'll spend the whole message on one verse. Sometimes, like last week, we went through the whole Holy Week story. We read a lot of verses last week. Okay? Some messages are um, about a topic, and some are very, very, they're all very scriptural, but some are um, have a lot more scripture in it than others. Okay? They're all based on scripture. What I'm getting is don't take it for granted. Check me out. Read the Bible. This is my opinion. This isn't my thought. This is God's words. Mark. 114 says this after John the Baptist was put in prison Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God verse 15 the time has come Jesus said the kingdom of God has come near repent and believe the good news let's pause there repent and believe the good news that's what Jesus said the words of Jesus himself two instructions what were they repent and believe. Repent and believe the good news. Well, repent. Here's another one of these churchy words. Okay, first we got gospel, now we got repent. Okay, we got to understand this. We got to get this. Okay, repent. Reverse your course. That'd be one definition. Repent. Reverse your course. Change your direction. Turn away from something. Turn to something else. In the Bible, it means, repent means, turn away from what Jesus hates. In turn to what Jesus loves. If you think about it, that means that you can't follow Jesus if you're living for the stuff that God hates. 
You can't fully and successfully follow Jesus if you're choosing to focus on and participate in the things that nailed him to the cross. Jesus said, repent. Reverse your course of action. Make a change. Repent is a verb. It takes action. I can't just say, I'm tired of doing this, God. I've been doing this my whole life. I feel so bad about it. Please forgive me and do it again tomorrow. Please forgive me. Make a change. That's what repent means. Make a change. It might just be a baby step. It might be a little change. A little change is a change. Don't just say you're going to make a change. Actually make a change. Take a step or two in a different direction. You don't have to be perfect. But you do have to choose to head in a direction. And then start to walk in that direction. Turn away from the things that God hates and turn towards the things that he loves. And not because of him, but because of you. God wants you to head in a new direction for you. It's going to help you. Think of all the dumb mistakes that we've made. I've made plenty. The consequences that come along with it. God doesn't want those for us. He's got a better way. Every aspect of life, he's got a better way. His way. Jesus said, follow me. I'm the way. Jesus said, repent and believe the good news. Your translation may say the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. That's exactly what gospel means. Good news. News that brings joy. Okay, back in Jesus' day, um, a gospel could have been any kind of a public announcement. So if somebody were to run out to the street, if we were all held captives as slaves, and if somebody ran out to the street and they said, hey, I went to war for you. I battled against your oppressor. I set you free. That would be a gospel. He's in the street proclaiming that he took an action that paid, that's going to change your today and change your forever. That's what a gospel is. An announcement of some event that just occurred that affects you. It will change your situation. So the gospel of Jesus Christ is no different. The gospel of Jesus Christ not only changes your here and now, but it changes your eternity. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not necessarily about improving your life now, but it, it sure can, and it probably will. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is about exchanging your life. Moving us from spiritual death to spiritual life. The gospel of Jesus Christ is what allows us to go back to God. It restores our relationship with God. You see, we're separated from God by our own sins. And we are reconnected to God or can be through our belief in Jesus Christ. We disconnect ourselves. We separate ourselves God gives us a way back. All of us. The gospel of Jesus Christ is, is one of the huge differences between Christianity and every other religion. Other religions, they offer advice and rules and commands. And they say, if you do this, if you follow these rules, if you do this, then you can go to heaven. That's not what the Bible says. It's not what the Bible teaches. It's not in there. You can look. The gospel is the good news. That you don't have to earn your way back to God. You don't have to earn your way to heaven. In fact, you cannot. It's already been done for you. That's what Easter's all about. Can't have the gospel without Easter. Jesus came. He lived. He died. He rose for you. The good news is that you don't have to earn your way back to heaven. It's been done for you. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For it is by grace... It's one of my favorite verses. I say that all the time. I know a lot of favorite verses, but Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Let's break that down for a minute. Ephesians 2, 8. For it is by grace. Another churchy word. What is this grace? God's unmerited favor. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. There's no way you can earn it on your own. It's grace it's given you. You have been saved through faith. All you need to do is believe in Jesus. You don't believe in your own faith. You don't say, I don't have enough faith. 
The strength of your faith is who your faith is in. My faith is in Jesus. That's all I need. Mustard seed is all you need. And this is not from yourself. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You see, this way, it's a gift from God to all of us. This way, I can't say, look at how holy I am. Holier than thou. Thou doesn't deserve heaven. We can't say that. Because we've all been given the gift of grace. We can't say, he doesn't deserve to go to heaven. Look at him. I do. It's a free gift from God. It's a level playing field. It's available to all of us, this gift. No matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter how dirty you think you are, no, how, no matter how unworthy you think you are, God offers you a free gift, Jesus Christ. Grace comes with it. We receive this person, Jesus, fully man, fully God, who has given himself wholly and completely for you. And that's the kind of good news that will change you forever. Let's look at the gospel just for a couple more minutes and we'll move on. There's, re there's two really important aspects to the gospel, two important parts of the gospel. The why and the what. Why? Why do we need this gospel? Why do we really need it? Why is the gospel necessary? Well, because we're all sinners and God is not. Okay? God is holy. We are not. God is perfect. We're not close. And sometimes when we have been in church for a while, we might forget that. That we're not perfect. Sometimes when we've never been in church, we might forget that. We're not perfect. That just because we do something and believe something, have done it for years, doesn't make it right. We all need to humble ourselves, every one of us. We need to learn right from wrong. God's word, the light, shines into darkness, exposes sin, my sin and yours. Sin, another one of these churchy words. Well, sin is any action that we take against the will of God. Sin is any action that we take that would displease God. Anything that would rebel against him. Sin is anything that separates you from God, moves you away from God. The Bible, Romans 8, 7, Paul says this about sin. Sin is an action that is hostile towards God. Think about that, hostile. Sin is an action that's hostile towards God. But what is hostile? Hostile is not a word that we use a whole lot. Sin is any action that is contrary to God. Okay, I know I read this in the Bible, but I've been doing it my whole life. Seems all right, I'm not hurting anyone. I'm going to do it anyway. That's contrary to God. But I like doing this. Not hurting anyone. It's comfortable. It's contrary to God. It's hostile to God. It's a sin. Sin is an action that is hostile, antagonistic towards God, aggressive towards God, confrontational to God. Oh, God, I know you said to do this. I know you put this. I know you've got this for me to do. I know you asked me to do this. I'm not going to do it. I like to do this. I can follow my plan. Sin is an action that is hostile, belligerent, combative, bitter. I can't believe you're putting me through this, God. How could you do this to me? After all I've done for you, look what you're doing to me. Sin is an action that is bitter towards God, hateful towards God. So according to the Bible, our choice to carry out sin in our life, it's like saying, I don't want you, God. I don't need you, God. My plan is what I, what I need. Look at me. I'm doing great. I've done great all these years without you. Look at me, God. <coughs> Just leave me alone. <coughs> I can live life my own way. I can do my own thing. I don't need you, God. That's being antagonistic. That's being pretty hostile towards God. Sin. Get this, sin is an eternal offense against an eternal God which requires eternal payment in a place called hell. An eternal place of unending punishment and wrath. The Bible describes it as weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't know if you've ever been in such pain where you're gnashing your teeth. 
Just as heaven is a place of God's eternal favor and blessing, hell is a place of eternal pain and suffering. Eternal pain and suffering. Nobody wants that. God doesn't want that for you. God wants to be in a relationship with you here and now. God wants you to know him, really know him, really know his character. God wants you to love him. He made you. The Bible says that you were made fearfully and wonderfully. He knit you together in your mother's womb. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. And he wants to spend an eternity with you. In heaven. God is holy. He's a just God. How can God remain holy and just? How can he maintain justice and still allow us sinners to enter into heaven, a place that's perfect and holy? He can't. Somehow our wrongs need to be righted. Somebody has to take the punishment that we deserve. Somebody has to take the punishment that we earn. You see, you earn this need for punishment. Why? Romans 6, 23. For the wage of sin is death. You earn a wage. The Bible says the wage of sin is death. You take action hostile toward God, you're earning death. <clears throat> Think about some of the dumb things you've done in your life. The consequences. It plays out, right? I'm hostile to God. I do things I know I shouldn't be doing and I'm still paying the price for it today. You earn death through your actions. Somebody needs to pay the price for our sins. That's all part of the why. That's why we need this gospel. <coughs> and of what? And of the gospel. And of the good news. John 3.16, we sang it in the song this morning. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You earn death. God loved you. Jesus paid the price. Scripture says God so loved the world. God so loved you. Put your name in there. Put your name in the blank. God so loved you that he sent his one and only son to die in your place. We can't let that become familiar. All you have to do is believe. That's the good news. That's what Holy Week and the Easter story is all about. You can't have the gospel without Easter. So Easter, the Easter story. Let's turn to Isaiah 53, 1 through 6. This is a prophecy about Jesus Christ written about 700 years, 680 years, 683 years before Jesus was even born. This is written. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And then Isaiah begins to talk about Jesus. Verse 2. He grew up before him like a tender shoot. And like a root out of dry ground, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Let's pause there for a minute. He's predicting that God would look, that Jesus would look like a regular guy. And that's pretty much what the New Testament confirms. He was just a regular guy. He wasn't like a superhero looking guy. There was nothing physically about him that would attract us. There's something on the inside. Something on the inside. That's a lesson for us. That it doesn't matter what we look like on the outside. It's always a heart issue. Verse 3. He was despised and rejected by mankind. Pause again. Jesus was despised and rejected by mankind. Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel like you're dejected by your own family, rejected by your own classmates, co-workers, friends? Jesus gets that. He was too. Especially when you start to stand up for him, when you start to talk about the gospel outside of these walls, you're going to get some rejection. You're going to have people come at you. It's okay. Jesus did too. Verse 3 again, he was despised and rejected by mankind. A man suffering and familiar with pain. Does your life seem hard? Do you got pain in your life? Is your life tough? Is your life full of pain at times? Jesus gets it. He experienced all this. Back to the scripture, like from whom people hid their faces. He was despised. He was held in low esteem. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. 
He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us turned to our own way. Let's pause it for a minute. Have you ever turned away from Jesus? If you were a follower of Jesus and you've been following, how many times a day do we turn away from Jesus? Jesus says, I'm the way, follow me. How many times do you turn away? Okay, it's predicted 700 years before Jesus was born, 2,700 years more now. We all, all of us, you and I, we are all like sheep. We've all gone astray. Each one of us have turned to our own way. God, I know what you tell me in, in your word, but I want to do this. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Just listen again to the list of sacrifices that Jesus made for you. I, I just pulled these right out of the scripture. I think there's nine here. There was more than that in the scripture. Jesus was despised. Just think he's doing all this stuff for you. Despised. He was rejected. He suffered. He had pain. He was punished. He was pierced. He was crushed. He was punished some more. He was wounded. Why? So that we might be healed, the scripture says. And if you try to soak all that in, you got to step back and allow it to soak in. I always say this, don't just read a ton of scripture, read a little scripture, allow it to sink in, allow it to marinate into you. Allow what Jesus did to marinate into your soul. What did he do for you? If you allow the Holy Spirit to open your eyes, to what's going on here in the gospel on Easter. There's one huge fact. Think about all these sacrifices. There is one huge fact that's going to land on you. There's one truth that comes to mind. There is a God. And he has gone to unimaginable lengths to tell you, I love you. What do you want you to know? And when you get that, you'll be changed today and forever. <clears throat> when the reality of how much God loves you sinks in, and when the realization of the sacrifice and love that is wrapped up in the good news, in the gospel, <clears throat> when that sinks in, it should floor you, really. Imagine how much you would have to love somebody that you would do what Jesus did for you for that person. Imagine how much you would have to love somebody for you to willingly go through what Jesus went through. Nails through his hands, spikes through his legs, pierced, crushed, beaten, whipped, spit on. Would you do that for anyone in your life? Jesus did it for you. You should be wanting to just say thank you. That's what coming here for worship is. Just say thank you, Lord. We should be at a point where we're just like, here, God, I'm all in. Show me how I can point other people to you. Show me how I can share the little bit or a lot that I know about you. How, how do I do that? How do I share with other people? Here's my time. Here's my talents. Here's my, my treasures. Use them for your will. I don't believe that you can fully understand the way of the gospel and not be changed. And I believe that this is where Mark 12, 30 comes from. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Those are the words of Jesus, the command given to us. When we understand the events in the love that's behind the gospel, behind the good news, we will want to run to God. When we get it, we will want to love him with all of our hearts and soul and strength and mind. We want to love him with everything we are. The good news is not just about getting us to heaven. The good news is about getting us back to God. He loves you. He's got this amazing purpose and plan for your life. 
Maybe you're here this morning and you're unsure about how God feels about you. Maybe you think he's mad at you. There's a lot of people think that God's mad at me. He's mad at me. If you knew this, Pastor, if you knew the stuff I've done, you know he's mad at me. Look at my life. Maybe you think God doesn't like you. Maybe you think God gave up on you. Maybe you think that God's got you on a shelf. I've been running after the Lord for years. And nothing's becoming of it. I feel like I'm just on a shelf. The good news says no. The gospel says no. The gospel says God loves you. You're not on a shelf. He's not mad. He's not giving up on you. He has a plan for you. The good news, the gospel settles the issue of how God feels about you. It says, I love you. That's what it's all about. God literally drove a stake in the ground. Said, this is how much I love you. My only son is going to die on this cross for you. In your place. You cannot say God does not like you based on your temporary emotions or your feelings or your current situation. You can't say God doesn't love you. God will outlast all of that. God's in that with you. Understand and believe that God loves you. He's for you. Want some proof? Look at the cross. Look at the gospel. Look at the good news. Look at Easter. Once you allow the full weight of Holy Week and the Easter story and the good news, once you allow the, the weight of God's love for you, once you allow this to really land on you and sink in and marinate in to your soul, your life will be impacted. You got to get some time alone. You got to pray. You got to read. You got to get into this. Your life will never be the same. You're going to want to know more. You're going to desire to serve people. You're going to learn to see the world, not just through the eyes of Christ, but you're going to learn to see the world through his heart. You're not going to want to let people continue to make these poor choices in their lives. You're not judging them. You're guiding them to something better, something different. If they continue down that road, it's not going to a good place. Our daily Bible reading this week it came up with a scripture very similar to this. And for those who read the daily Bible scripture, I said that I think ACDC had it right. That there is a highway to hell. There's a million people running down it, full speed. They want to be pointed out. It's a stairway to heaven. They got it right too. It's a narrow path. Very few are on it. We want others to be on it. We want others to get off this wide road, leading to death and destruction. This is not a phase. I'm not in a phase. You will not be in a phase when you accept Jesus Christ and begin to chase after him. It's not some emotional state that we get into. It's not just some fad that's going to wear off. This isn't going to be just some fad that we, we take off my cross and I take off my Bible and I put it in a box and put it in the garage with all my other stuff that was a fad, as my yo-yos and all that good stuff. It's not just another fad. It's not a phase. This is a way of life. It's God's word. It's the truth. Here's a statement I think that we can all agree on. You are bold for what you love. Okay, we've been in a series on being bold now for the last four weeks. I was going to skip over these two weeks, but no. What is more bold than what Jesus did for us on the cross? You're bold for what you love. So we love a sports team. You stand up for it. You defend the sports team. Somebody's trash talk your sports team, you'll stand up boldly for it. You know about them, you, you like them. Somebody does something to one of your kids, somebody mistreats your child in some way, you're going to be pretty bold. Watch Mama Bear come to their defense, right? Are you bold for God? Before God ever asks anything of you, before God asks you to do anything, He wants you to know Him. He wants you to understand his character. He wants you to know what he has done for you. Because when we understand what he did for us out of love for you, you'll gladly turn around and do it for him, out of love for him. So are you boldly chasing after God in your readings, in your prayers? Are you boldly reading? Are you boldly praying? Are you boldly sharing the gospel with others? Are you boldly sharing your faith story? We talked a lot about that. Are you boldly in pursuit of happiness, holiness, 
Are you boldly repenting? Are you boldly making these changes in your life? We are bold about what we love. Do you know the gospel? I mean, do you really know it? Have you allowed it to sink in? Are you understanding what's really behind the, the gospel, God's love for you? If you're not being bold, or if you feel you could be bolder, why aren't you? What's in the way of you stepping up for God? What's in the way of you being bold? What's holding you back? Maybe poor choices. Maybe it's that hostility towards God. Maybe it's these poor decisions. Maybe it's your desires, your actions. I've always done this. I've never hurt anyone. It's just me. It's only hurting me. It's only hurting you. God doesn't want that. What's holding you back? Compromises, personal justifications. When we compromise and we do these personal justifications, when I say, God, you can have all this stuff over here, but these things here, I'm hanging on to these for a while. When you say that kind of stuff, our sense of right and wrong stops. What's black and white becomes gray. We become blind to the truth. We start to ignore the prompts of the Holy Spirit. When you're a believer, the Holy Spirit enters inside your heart and will guide you through these questions, through these choices. You need to figure it out. What's keeping you from being bold? Repent from that. Turn away from it. Turn to Jesus. Make the change. When you fully allow the passion, the love that's behind the Easter story, that's behind the good news, when you allow that to marinate, you will become bold for Christ. When you choose to believe the gospel, your relationship with God through Jesus will grow. Your love for God will explode. It will overflow, the Bible says. And you'll be bold. Think about that statement again. We're bold about what we love. Makes sense. But that statement is not just true for you and me. Okay, get this. That statement is true for God. He loves you. And he's bold about you. Romans 8.31, Paul says, If God is for us, who can be against us? Think about that. The creator of the universe. He made everything. He can turn an egg into a chicken. He can turn a, a caterpillar into a butterfly. He can make you and I have nothing. He can create the human eye. He's for you. He wants the best for you. Who could possibly come against you when God is for you? Don't worry about it. You have God boldly standing behind you. Hebrews 13, 5, God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. God says, all that I am is for you. Jesus died on the cross, rose three days later. That's the good news. That's the gospel. So we wrap this all up with, with a question. Just step back and think about your life for a minute. Okay, we just talked about the gospel. Here it is Easter. Not 100% sure what's going on right now. Here's your question. What type of life do you want? Moving forward, what type of life do you want? You want to continue to follow your plan? We get one shot at life here on earth. And God's saying, come on. Follow me. Look what I did for you. I love you. I gave my son for you. He gave his life for you on the cross. He rose. He showed himself to over 500 people, the scripture says. Why? So that you would believe. One witness is all you need. One eyewitness is all you need in court. The Bible says over 500 people saw the risen Jesus walking on the face of the earth. So you would believe. Here's the good news. Here's Holy Week. God saying, here's the Easter story. Believe. Love me. Be bold for me. Point others to me. Share your story. Share what God has done. In your life. Teach others what Jesus has taught you. Be bold. Step out of the boat. In faith. Fear not. God says, watch me do stuff through your life. <clears throat> God says, I don't need you to do anything. He created the world. He did it all. I don't need you to do anything. But God says, I want you. 
when you're bad. You've all strayed like sheep. I want you all back. I sent my son to die in your place. And he did. And he rose. And that's the good news. And that's the gospel. He got it bold for you because he loves you. He wants you to be bold for him. It's your choice. What's God talking about this morning? What do you need to do about it? Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for this day. Father, I thank you for your word that you wrote down and we can just read whenever we want. We can get it on the CD. We can listen to it on the radio. Father, I just thank you so much for your word. Father, I thank you that we are able to gather here together as a family and read about you and hear about you and sing to you. Father, I'm so blown away by the fact that you would love me so much. That you would send your son. I have a son. I can't imagine. You would send your son to die in my place for my hostilities against you. Father, I thank you that you would send your son, Jesus Christ, to take the punishment that I earned do stupid things every day. And Father, I thank you that you came, you lived, you died on the cross for me. And three days later, you rose. Father, I thank you for that. Father, I just pray that each and every one of us can think about this today. We're only given today, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. Father, I pray that we do this today. We take action today that we don't leave this room until we come clean with you. I come perfect with you. But Father, I pray each and every one of us really gets real with you right now. If we're here this morning and we're believers, Father, I pray that we take that gospel and we allow it to wreck us so that we'll stand up bold for it because there's a world that's dying outside of these walls and they need Jesus. Jesus is the answer to everything. His way, His word. His truth. He's the way. Father, I pray that we all just allow this to soak in. And we are bold to share our stories with those around us. Point them to you. Invite them to you. Father, there's other people who might be here this morning that maybe they have questions and doubts and fears or other opinions. They have other beliefs. Father, I pray if there's folks here this morning that want you as their Lord and Savior, they never asked you in before. Father, I don't know if there's anyone here you do. Father, if there's somebody here that has never accepted you into their lives before, they never realized what the gospel is all about, and now they think they do. Father, I pray that these folks come, come clean with you. I know that if they're real with you, you'll be real with them. And if you're, if you're here right now, and if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior before, just, just say this little prayer. Just silently to yourself. It's between you and God. This isn't any magical incantation. It's just your heart to God's. Just pray something like this. Father, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm saved. I know I need a Savior. I know I'm not perfect. I am close. Father, I believe that you died on the cross for me. I believe that you took the punishment that I deserve. I want you as my Lord and Savior. Father, I will turn from my sins. I have been hostile towards you. I will turn from those things. Help me, God. Help me turn to you in every situation. I want you as my Lord and Savior. Heads down, eyes closed, no one looking around. If you just said that prayer, if you just accepted Jesus Christ, just please slip your hand up in the air. I just want to pray for you. I see you guys. I see you. I see you. Father, I pray that if these folks are real with you, you become real with them. You come into their lives. You let them know that you're real. I know you will. 
Father, I know that your word says that when we accept you as our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in and will reside in us forever. And that's the good news. We thank you so much for that.
somebody who didn't have a voice when they got here this morning, I think they were pretty good. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much once again for this day. Father, we thank you for Easter. We thank you for the gospel. We couldn't have Easter without the gospel. Father, we just thank you so much for this amazing day. Father, we thank you for, for your love for each and every one of us. We thank you for the gift of your son. Be with each and every one of us as we leave this place and return to our homes. In Jesus' name, amen. Real quickly, I just want to point a couple of things out. We do not have midweek worship this week. There's no school, so we will not have midweek worship on Wednesday night. Um, next Sunday, don't forget, next Sunday, right after the second service, we'll be going to the Fish Hatchery, Salmon River Waterfalls, and the Salmon River Reservoir. So if you want to go on that trip, just bring lunch with you. You can put it in the refrigerator, eat it during the sermon, whatever you want to do. And then we're all just going to head off to uh, see some of God's creation next Sunday. So there's uh, colored papers in all the bulletins. If you didn't get a bulletin, grab one. There's piles. It's an information sheet of everything that's going on over the next several months. We have the North Country Music Fest coming up, Vacation Bible School, a lot of big events this summer. There's always something going on, so do as much or as little as you want. We have opportunities for you to plug in, opportunities for you to serve, opportunities for you to grow. It's all about family. Um, we try to keep events where the entire family can go. We try not to separate out teens here, kids there, and adults there. We do have groups for each one of those, so we try to do as much as we can as a family together instead of being divided, so keep that in mind as well. Um, if you did accept Jesus Christ, I had something I want to get in your hands, so just come and talk to me at some point. I got a little booklet, um, no, just a little booklet I had to give you. If anybody here needs a Bible, let me know. We'll get you a Bible, and uh, I think that's all I had to say. Oh. If you're not friends with the church on Facebook, check out the church Facebook, too. That's really where we keep track of everything. A lot of people say that the Internet can be used for evil. What can be used for evil can also be used for good. And so we put a lot of stuff on Facebook. It's very active. There's a lot of information on there. So there's all that. Thanks again so much, guys. Um, happy Easter. If there's any food back there, make sure to eat it up, fill your pockets up, stuff like that. <laughs> Thank you.